Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 206, we're going to take a look at mains power, or household voltage. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Okay, so what's an important part of your system that you almost never think about? Yes, the mains or household power. Now, depending on what part of the world you live in, that voltage can range from 110 volts AC all the way to 240 volts AC. AC just stands for alternating current. So, and you can have anything from 60 to uh, a 200 amp service entrance. Though in reality, most of you will either be on the North American standard of 120 volts AC or the European standard of 230 volts AC. And that's plus or minus. In fact, the plus and minus, if you watch um, your, your power uh, um, feed, uh, in real time, you'll see that it actually can fluctuate quite a bit, almost a volt in the span of less than a minute. So, and th it, that'll depend on what time of day it is, uh, where you live, a whole bunch of things, even the load you've got on that circuit itself in your own house. Now, in most cases, living in the low or high voltage region doesn't affect your equipment because 230 volts is a multiple of 115 volts. And it is relatively easy to make a power transformer with a universal primary that can easily switch between the two voltage regions. A lot of modern equipment actually has a switch on the rear to set the voltage to either the high region or the low region. Caution, never plug in any piece of new equipment without first checking to see if the voltage is set for your region or some really bad things could happen. Now, what does matter a lot is how clean that power is. I used to have a friend who ran the maintenance crew at a large power station and he told me, if your house was next door to the power station, you would have perfectly clean power. Unfortunately, most of us don't have that luxury, and instead we have long transmission runs, substations, industrial users, noisy smaller power generators, our own street step-down transformers, and neighbors all on that power supply. So it's not surprising that it will have a wee bit of noise on the line. So. I'm going to set, get set up in a minute, but we're going to take a look at our own uh, power supply. This is uh, what I, I'm, I see on my own bench, and I think you'll start to understand what I'm talking about. Okay, I'll be back in a second. Okay, so we've got the scope set up um, into uh, 100 times um, AC, and I've carefully taking and let me see if I can get it on camera here for you carefully taking an IEC inlet and I've clipped the scope on and I've actually clipped the voltmeter on as well and I'm going to tuck this down carefully because it's live don't do not do this at home do not repeat this um, it's not the safest thing to have live leads around on the bench but I'm a professional, so <laughs> we'll be a little bit extra careful. So, at first glance, this doesn't look too bad, right? You've got, you've got an AC sine wave. Uh, for some reason, the scope's not reading the frequency, but we're at, um, our frequency at the generating station is 60 hertz. Um, all of North America is at 60 hertz. Um, and I think all of Europe is running at 50. Um, Somebody can correct me on that. Um, and if we look a little bit closer, though, you can see that we don't have a nice, clean sine wave. In fact, we're actually sort of flattening out on the top or the peak. 
and the trough. And what that's showing us is that there's probably a fair amount of load on the, uh, on the mains line feed, not in our house, but probably on the street or even uh, on the main high voltage feed that goes to our step down transformer. I think our uh, high voltage on most of our secondary lines is 20,000 volts and then it gets stepped down of course. Um, but if there wasn't that much of a load on, we would see a nice clean sine wave. What else can we see here? Well, you see all this little sort of fuzzy stuff along here, particularly way down here, where we normally would see a nice smooth um, turn of the sine wave. You can see a lot of noise sitting down in here and along here. And um, that, of course, tells us the power is not that clean. Now, you can even see here a little bit of a kink in here. And um, so none of that's good. Now, uh, last week, uh, we were working on the new uh, modern line phono preamp, and uh, we were interested to see how much uh, noise in our main supply we actually had to clean up in the power supply. And we were surprised uh, that day um, we had even some jagged, um, messy stuff um, along, um, along our sine wave. And uh, it was truly awful. But obviously, oh, look, it, it kinked a little bit more over here um, and down here as well. So if we were right next to, right next door to uh, a, a decent power generating station. It wouldn't matter if it was um, an old coal plant uh, or a modern gas plant or even a nuclear plant. The, the actual generators that make the electricity are going to be very, very similar, even if they are separated by, let's say, 100 years in manufacturing, because the technology itself has not changed that much since Tesla invented uh, AC power. And um, and essentially electrified the world. So here's a big shout out to Nicholas Tesla, um, one of the gr truly great engineering geniuses uh, of history. Okay, now another thing that you should be aware of is that in most cases you can't 100% rely on the voltage you're, you're seeing on a scope. Right now you can see our scope, and this is a really good quality scope. These hand techs are amazing. Um, but they don't read voltage that well. So it's showing approximately 127 volts and it's fluctuating. So what I've done is I've, I've put our digital voltmeter on. And let me just see if I can nestle it there so that you can have a look at it. And you can see that the voltage is shifting a little bit over time. But it's, it's basically around 119 point. Oh, it's down a little bit. It's, it normally sits around 119.5 volts. I've seen it a little bit over 120 volts, and I've seen it right down around 119 volts. So it shifts within uh, within about a volt. Uh, so we're talking about a little bit under 1%. So that's, that's actually pretty good when you think about it. Um, but this just goes to show you that... Um, that there's room for improvement because all of our gear, whether it's a preamp or a power amp, is essentially a very complicated valve that controls, you guessed it, the mains power. And then that's right through to your speakers. So if your mains power is not perfectly clean, um, then you're gonna have to deal with that problem later on. Um, starting in your power supply with an excellent filtering stage. Um, and of course we take the AC uh, sine wave, the AC power coming into the primary side of our transformers and we rectify it on the secondary side and we turn it into DC. If we were to, um, to probe a DC uh, line voltage, we would see just a very flat line at whatever the voltage level was. And the flatter the line, the cleaner the DC. 
With AC, the smoother and the more true the sign is without any of this noise, um, the, the purer and cleaner the signal is. So in the future, uh, Charles is really keen um, to do some work on some sort of a power regenerator, hopefully using tubes. And it's, well, I haven't put it up on, the, on, our, on our prototype board yet, but I think I'll add it when I'm done the video. And this winter, we're just going into our fall now, but winter is just around the corner. This winter, when it's dark and it's rainy, and um, there's not a lot of things you can do outside here, um, other than the occasional nice day, we'll do some develop it, w development work, and we'll see if we can put a device between the main supply and the uh, plug of our preamps and our power amps and, and see if we can come up with something that will generate a much cleaner, um, purer uh, AC uh, power feed. Well, hopefully that was interesting. Now, we do have some really interesting tubes to take a look at. So just stay, stay, stay with me, and I'm going to reset the bench, and I'm going to make it safe, get all this uh, exposed power turned off before I start mounting some tubes up here. Oh, and I, I almost forgot to mention the, the interesting thing about uh, AC power or alternating um, current is that um, here's our, here's our, our zero volt line right here and the power that's that is generated is in this portion here this is where the energy is it's up in here it's up in here it's over here in the sine wave and the very top of it is actually almost a floating voltage there's not much energy up in here as uh, the generating uh, station um, as the generator itself cycles, right? I mean, when you see this sine wave, this is actually sourced right back to the windings on the generator and, um, and the frequency that it, it's being presented with. Now, there's lots of things in between, including uh, step-down transformers and, um, and uh, intermediary power stations. So, there's lots of things that can affect um, your AC sine wave, but seeing this top uh, of the wave cut off like this is essentially the uh, heavy load basically taking away the power that's very that's not usable. That's what I'm trying to say. So it's not a total disaster that we're seeing that the that the the mains voltage is loaded down like this. But it's also not that great a sign. In fact, um, and over the years, uh, I periodically drop in on our mains voltage to check to see what is actually going on. Because, you know, everything on the bench, the test equipment, uh, prototype testing, uh, our critical listening system all relies on a decent AC supply. And um, this is actually the first time I've ever seen it loaded down this this way. So it's kind of fascinating. Okay, let's get the bench reset. Okay, last week um, we did an episode on brown base 6SN7s and I, I, frankly I was incredibly surprised at the reaction. I mean the, the, the tubes that we had in inventory basically sold out in a matter of hours. It was just insane. Um, and um, anyways, Charles said, no, no, I fully expected that. <laughs> People love the uh, the early mil spec tubes, and talking about mil spec tubes, um, I think I mentioned at the time that we were almost out of one of my favorite um, Sylvania 12 SN7s, and we were looking in our inventory for a customer's order. Um, he's interested in the early uh, 6 SN7s for the Universal 6 or 12 SS. <laughs> I knew I was going to screw that up. Our our um, Universal 6 or 12 SN7 kit preamp, which is our best-selling uh, preamp by far. And it's not surprising because it can 
uh, sonically you can just roll so many tubes and it just sounds so amazing um, and um, anyways I, I thought we had run out of these and we were digging in the in the inventory in our little warehouse and um, lo and behold we found some more and um, and I was just that was just like the happiest moment of my day because I love these tubes and uh, we had an order um, last weekend and we had two really nice ones left and I, I shipped them out and I thought geez we should really have kept two for ourselves <laughs> and then I found some more so let's open them up these all arrived with the same date uh, code on the packing so they were packed in February 67 but they're marked as GTs now these are the 12 volt version so they can't plug into a 6 volt uh, 6SN7 socket right everybody knows that but the universal preamp of course is designed so it can take either the 6SN7 or the 12SN7 so that gives you an incredible amount of flexibility and when we when I shouldn't say we because I first designed it uh, uh, and Charles actually helped with the redesign that we did later on, but when we first and when I first designed it um, There was only as far as I could tell one other company um, That was producing a commercial product that had a you know that could take the 6SN7 or the 12SN7 and Now if you look you'll find that there are literally dozens of companies that have got switchable filament supplies So I like to think that we led the charge a little bit along that line It was something that is so easy to do that it makes no sense not to include the 12 volt version because the 6SN7 itself, the better vintage ones, are basically going extinct. There's, we still have a little bit of inventory left of the very good ones, but not a lot. We still, though, have decent inventory of the 12SN7s, including the famous Bad Boys. That's right, we've got Sylvania Bad Boy 12SN7 GTs, Newell stock, new in the box, which is insane. Now, that inventory is almost gone. Um, people, people who build the Universal preamp buy those bad boys up. It's almost the first pair they buy in every case. But anyways, so have a look at these. These do not look like early GTs, and that's because they're not. These are uh, mid-production GTBs. Um, by 1967, we were already mm, maybe nine years into producing a GTB. And what happened is these are these are um, these are a government contract order. They're probably war surplus uh, from the late 60s. I'll let you guess what war that would have been. They never left the United States, as far as I can tell. So they actually never went off to fight. Um, but what happened is um, the Sylvania got an order for the GT for a 12 SN7 GT, and they wanted to fill it, uh, but there's no, there was no production of GTs. There hadn't been any production of GTs since, um, well, since about maybe 1952. So, um, and they certainly weren't going to start up a production line to make a lower spec tube. So all they did was they took a 12 SN7 uh, GTB and they just relabeled it. Basically, that's all they did, and um, so they provided a, a higher spec. Uh, tube to meet their contract, but these these are amazing sounding tubes. They are um, They're sort of they bridge the different the different generations of Sylvania from the early um, really open sounding um, uh, With uh, um, su Really superior bass the GTs the bad boys all the way up to the last generation uh built in uh, the 1970s, uh, the GTBs. And this is sort of sits mm, a little bit in between the GTA and the GTB, even though I would, I would, I would bet you anything it's actually a GTB. And they're just, they're magical tubes. They've got the higher specs. They've got uh, perhaps, we don't know this for sure, but perhaps they have uh, a mil-spec filament. That's a possibility. I just don't know. 
Um, and th there's no data sheets in most cases that tell you that they've upgraded the filament for a, a mil spec order. But I've never had one of these fail. I've never had one of these even get weak. Uh, and we run these uh, quite a bit in our system. So anyways, um, there's more of these. So, and the other thing that I found um, this week is we got a whole bunch of 6CG7s. Now, you might say, what the heck does a 6CG7 have to do with a 6SN7 or a 12SN7? Well, the 6CG7 is the exact tube electrically as the 6SN7 is. The only difference is that they put it inside a miniature 9-pin bottle. A tall bottle, but still it's a miniature bottle. And these are a very early Sylvania version. Now this is rebranded RCA, but Sylvania made this tube. And let me grab the other one. We don't have a lot of them that are, we have quite a few of them, but we don't have a lot of them are close match, but we have a few of them. And um, you can see it's got a flat black uh, plate. It even looks like the plate was rubbed a little bit, and it's probably just how the industrial coating process worked. It didn't quite stick on the ribs 100%. Anyways, Charles had to listen to these, and these are lovely sounding tubes. Um, and they're not, they're not that common. They're not rare, but they're not that common because Sylvania made the sta this tube in a standard corrugated uh, plate version not long after uh, these came out. And that's a very common tube. Um, and the thing that Charles said that's really interesting is these early Sylvania 6CG7s have the Sylvania house sound. They've got that sort of warm, rich mid-range with good detail. The same thing that we see over in the 6SN7s and the 12SN7s. So it was really a thing with Sylvania. And I, and I don't think anybody's really sure whether they the engineers designed the tubes so that they had that sonic profile, or if it was just the materials uh, and manufacturing process that just gave them that automatically. I like to think that those those engineers um, knew what they were doing and they actually were aiming for those sonics because a lot of Sylvania tubes, whether they're in the octo bottle or in the miniature nine pin bottle, th they sound amazing um, right across the board. So. It's one of my go-tos. Okay, well, if you stayed to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out. There is a secret code that's quite easy to figure out that people have been getting. In fact, last weekend was huge. Uh, it, it's taken us all week to finish filling up all the orders. And people are grabbing codes left, right, and center. And we can reach pretty much everybody around the world with flat rate $20 shipping. If you're in a difficult to ship region though, drop us a line before you order and we'll see if we can figure it out. And if yours is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us folks. Stay safe everyone, this is Jim. Missing Charles, he'll be back next week hopefully. He's a little under the weather today. And um, yeah, uh, cheers everyone.